Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. You have your Bible, won't you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 6. We're going to begin our reading in verse 1. And we'll read down through verse 9. I'm going to title this sermon, When Chance Died. When Chance Died. And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. The Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to its place. And they said, If ye send away the ark of God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering. Then you shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then said they, What shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? And they answered, Five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For one plague was on you all, and on your lords. Wherefore ye shall make images of your emeralds and images of your mice that mar the land, and ye shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Peradventure, he will lighten his hand from off you, and from off your gods, and from off your land. Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts, as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts, when he had wrought wonderfully among them? Did they not let the people go, and they departed? Now therefore make a new cart, take two milch kine, on which there hath come no yoke, and tie the kind to the cart, and bring their calves home from them. Take the ark of the Lord, and lay it upon the cart, and put the jewels of gold, which ye return him for a trespass offering, in a coffer by the side thereof, and send it away, that it may go. And see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast, to Beth Shemesh. Then he hath done this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us, it was a chance that happened to us. A careless sailor on going to sea remarked to his religious brother, Tom, you talk a great deal about religion and providence, and if I should be wrecked and a ship was to heave inside and take me off, I suppose you would call it a merciful providence. It's all very well, but I believe no such things. These things happen like other things by mere chance, and you call it providence, that's all. He went on his voyage, and the case he had hypothetically put was soon literally true. He was wrecked and remained upon the wreck three days when a ship appeared and seeing their signal of distress came to their relief. He returned and relating it said to his brother, Oh, Tom, when that ship hove in sight, my words to you came in a moment to my mind and it was like a bolt of thunder. I have never got rid of it. And now I think it no more than an act of common gratitude to give myself up to him who pitied and saved me. That is an old story from an old preacher by the name of White Cross of two brothers. And so we come to the idea today that chance is going to die. We're going to begin here in verse 1, and you'll notice that it says, The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines for seven months. The Hebrew word here for country is actually field. It was in the field of the Philistines, which is not an uncommon, especially in this period, for this time period, this word sometimes is used to describe a country. It was said of Ruth that she went, uh, of Naomi, that she went to Moab, and actually it was the field of Moab. Um, So sometimes that word field can be used for country, but this has led some people to suggest that the Philistines were so afraid of the ark by this time, they were afraid to bring it into a city, Uh, they were afraid to set it in another temple, and so they just took it out into an open field and left it because they didn't want it around anybody because of all that had happened to them. But then when they did that, suddenly mice just started springing up out of the ground just this, you know, the creative God of the ark just made mice, and here mice now ruined their crop. 
uh, destroyed the corn crop which was in the ear and ready for harvest. And you, you remember the reading here just a moment ago. It said that the mice marred their land. So not only did they have these tumors, these boils that had popped up on their bodies and in very tender places, but also now they had these mice that were just ravaging their harvest. I mean, ha- that's a nightmare for most of us to think about that many mice just devastating the crops. So they couldn't do anything with the ark that, uh, that would satisfy the Lord. And you'll notice also that it says there in that first verse that the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines for seven months. Seven months. Dr. Henry says sinners lengthen out their own miseries by obstinately refusing to part with their sins. And then I insert there, or to even recognize their sin. Seven months. And they knew. They knew exactly why it was going on. And verse 2 uh, we find out that they knew because they say there in verse 2, the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners saying, what shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we shall send it to his place. They wanted to get rid of it. They knew that this was God's hand. So they say, what are we going to do? And notice in verse 2 it says, they called for the priests and the diviners. Now these were not priests of God. These were priests of Dagon, priests of Baal, priests of whoever happened to be in their popular pantheon at the time. These were these kind of priests. These were heathen priests. These were pagan priests and diviners. We know about diviners. They deal with the dark arts. So these are people that deal with demons and things. So we have people that are dealing with demons and people that are dealing with the images of demons, the priests of their temples, and they call them together because these are their wise men. And they say, what should we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us how to send it back home. So after seven months of living with the boils and the mice and the broken gods, they decide that the ark in their presence is the reason for the plague among them. And of course, the calling of the diviners is nothing new in the record of scripture. We have it in Joseph's story in Genesis chapter 41. We also have it in Daniel's story in Daniel chapter 2 and in Daniel chapter 5. The diviners are called and they, they either do or they don't have an idea of what's going on. And in this case, we find some very interesting things that the diviners tell us. We have here the very first question. There are three questions that we want, I want to follow today. The first one is right here. What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? They want to know, what are we going to do? And here's the remedy that that the diviners and the priests give them. They say, um, if you're going to send away the ark of Israel, the ark of the God of Israel, send it not empty. So that's the very first thing out of the box. You're going to send it back. Let's send it back with some sort of offering. They could have just carried it back to Ebenezer and left it there. That's where they had it. That's where they got it from. They could have taken it right back to Ebenezer or to Aphek or to any place. They could have carried it. They, they've already carried it from Aphek all the way down to Ashdod, and then they carried it to Gath, and then they carried it to Akron, or they put it on a cart or something. They've, they've handled this thing for seven months. Then they took it out into some field someplace and set it down. They've, they've been all over this thing. Why can't they just carry it back? But they, they want to know how to do it. And so they asked these diviners, what are we going to do? Well, it's sent, you can't send it away empty. He says, but in any wise, return him a trespass offering. So they wanted to appease God whom they had offended. And, of course, that's something that they understood. This is the totality of pagan religion. They always are dealing with a God who's mad, who has been offended. And so Dagon, whether it's Dagon or whether it's Baal or whether it's any of them, I mean, you name any of the gods in the pantheons that you know of, the Egyptian pantheon, the Roman pantheon, the Greek pantheon, any of the heathen gods, you name it, uh, the Canaanite pantheon, you, you always are dealing with a God that's angry and you're always trying to appease them. That's why for them the idea of propitiation is so important. They want to appease the God so that there will be a blessing for them. So they understand this if-then idea. If we give the God what he wants or what she wants, then we'll get back from him or her exactly what we want. And in this case, the if part is 
an offering so that the thin part will be healing. And you'll see this as the diviners continue to talk. To appease the God was central because if the God was mad, then things always went sideways. And in Philistia, in all the major cities and in the entire countryside, things had really gotten twisted. People were dying because of the disease. The mice were eating up the crop. And by the way, it was harvesting time. I forget who it was that I read that said the, I think it was Dr. Gray who said that the ark was in the land of the Philistines from October to May. Because in May, they have a harvest of grain in all that country. And the area where the Philistines uh, were in control was called the Shephelah. It's a beautiful and very fertile valley. And they were all the time harvesting crops. So you had two, two major crops every year that would be harvested in that part of the world. And so the springtime crop was always a crop of grain. It was planted in the fall. It enjoyed all the water throughout the wintertime. And in the spring, it was up, it was in the ear, and it was ready to be harvested. So when these mice are in the land, they are destroying the harvest for the springtime. And they say, well, let's send you back a trespass offering. And you'll notice the then statement. Then ye shall be healed. This, of course, they knew would be the result of this trespass offering. But you notice the language they use here. They call it a trespass offering, not a sin offering. They're not saying we're sinners. They're saying that we've made a mistake. We made an error in our relationship to God's holiness. Again, they don't want to deal with the root cause, but with the surface issue which means sending the ark away and making God happy through some sort of an offering. If you want to know about the trespass offering, you can look over in Leviticus chapter 5. Uh, the entire chapter deals with the trespass offering. And you'll notice here that it's, um, it's very interesting that there's nothing from Leviticus here in this statement. They didn't know anything about that. They're doing their best here. They're sort of shooting from the hip because they don't really know what the Lord would want. They don't really know how best to appease him. So they just say, well, let's just do our very best here. Return a trespass offering. Then healing will come. And then you'll notice that next statement, and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. That is to say, it will be known that it is his hand that's doing this to you. If we send the trespass offering, and then you're healed. Then you'll know, yes, it was the God of the Israelites that did this to us. Okay, now we come to question number two, verse four. And they said, what shall the trespass offering which we shall send, which we shall return to him be? So they want to know what it is. They want to know what to do, and then they want to know what offering do we give? So apparently, the entire country of the Philistines was affected by the plague. I mean, everybody in every city. And the mice were overrunning the countryside. And it was awful. And they, notice their answer here. They answered five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. One plague was on you all and on your lords. Now, this offering fails on a number of levels. But the most significant way that it doesn't that it fails is that it doesn't glorify Christ. This is not a blood sacrifice. Only by the shedding of blood is there remission of sin. And so the blood sacrifice looked forward to and glorified the work of God on the cross. Leviticus chapter 5, as I said, the entire chapter is about the trespass offering, and you can read specifically verses 14 through 19 in that chapter to learn of this. So these people didn't understand that. They didn't make a blood sacrifice. They just said, well, let's just give him something good in place of. And so the take, making of these emrods, these images, notice there in verse 5, they say, make images of your emrods and the images of your mice that mar the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. So the people were so steeped in their idolatry that they were making things that looked like their judgment. They were making more images. They're just, they're all about their images. And so they're making images of their judgment. And they're sending them back to the Lord as an offering. But they're making them out of gold. 
And so they're saying to him, this is what you did. This is what you did. These are the mice and these are the, these are the boils that were on us. We know it's your hand. And you notice that actually the priests and the diviners get something right here. They say, ye shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Because they acknowledge to him that he's the one that did this. And they forever, they forever create an image that suggests that God is to be glorified because he judged the Philistines for their trespass against him. And so they do that. To give glory to God would be to do it his way, but these folks, of course, are ignorant and are trying their very best. However, the glory they want to give is only to acknowledge his hand in the plague, a sort of nod to the God of heaven. They still haven't yet confessed their sin. And notice that the diviners say, peradventure he will lighten his hand from off you and off your gods and off your land. So from off of you means the boils. From off of your gods means, and notice that, just that's interesting, isn't it? That it's your gods. Oh, the only god we know about was Dagon and Ashdod. He fell down twice, second time broke. Only thing left was the fish part. But apparently it happened in more places than just Ashdod. Apparently, everywhere the ark went, it happened. It happened in Gath, it happened in Ekron, no doubt it happened wherever there was some sort of idol about. It must have happened in more than one city uh, that their gods were broken. So their, their religion is spoiled, their bodies are spoiled, and the mice marred the land. The plague of mice, how horrible this must have been. So make images of your emeralds, images of your mice that mar the land. You shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Peradventure he will lighten his hand from off you, from off your gods, and from off your lands. They just wanted him to leave them alone. Leave us alone. There's, they still hold on to their gods even though they're all broke. They're still holding on to the sin even though they've got boils on their bodies. They're still holding on to their national pride even though their nation is now ruined because of the mice. And then the diviners and the, and the priests say something here that is so insightful. Verse 6, and this is our third question, why do you harden your hearts? Why do you harden your hearts? Apparently, there must have been some hesitation on the part of the leadership to send the, to send the ark back. And you can understand this on a national level. The, the, you know, the five lords of the Philistines probably didn't want to send the ark back because the ark represented the Philistines' ultimate victory over Israel. They had taken the thing that represented their faith, their religion, the mercy seat. They had it. They had it. And so there must have been some hesitation then not to send it back because, you know, you send it back and then Israel thinks that, you know, um, maybe they couldn't handle things. Well, they couldn't, of course. And so you, you understand now the national pride that's involved here. So there's some hesitation, obviously, on the part of the leadership to send it back because they ask this question, why then do you harden your hearts? Or is this just a commentary on the seven months of doing nothing and people dying? At seven months, they had the ark in the countryside. Seven months. People are dying and they're doing nothing. Sometimes people love their sin so much that they're unwilling to let go even when they know they're headed for disaster. Sometimes people love their sin so much that they're unwilling to let go even when they know they're headed for disaster. And then, again, the diviners and the, and the priests here say something fascinating. As the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts, when he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go and they departed? Huh. They remembered something that Israel had forgotten. If only Israel had remembered 
this before the battle at Aphek. If only Israel had remembered this, they would have never called for the ark to come in among them. If only Israel had remembered the God that would protect them, they wouldn't have made an idol out of something sacred like the ark and lost it to the Philistines. If only Israel had remembered Egypt and Pharaoh and the hard hearts. If only they had remembered the wonderful works wrought among them. Because it wasn't just wrought amongst the Egyptians, it was wrought in the presence of Israel. And somehow Israel had forgotten that. But guess what? There's a cultural memory that's here. These people knew it. Do you remember the spies in Jericho? When the spies came to Jericho and they, they stayed the night in um, the harlot's house, I can't remember her name, Rahab. They stayed the night in Rahab's house, and Rahab said, we know who you are. We know that you're the ones who went through the, through the Red Sea on dry land. Your God did that for you. And we know that you're the ones who destroyed Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan. We know that God did that for you. And so trembling has come upon us because you're here now. They knew exactly what had happened. And so the Philistines knew exactly what had happened to the Egyptians. And these priests and the diviners, they say, uh, do you not remember the Egyptians? And it's almost like they're saying, you know, the Egyptians let them go. Why are you guys not letting them go? The Egyptians let them go, but it was too late for them. If we don't let the ark go back, it may be too late for us. The boils and the mice and who knows what else might come. They remembered all those plagues. He wrought wonderfully among them. I love that statement. I just, I just want to camp out here for a while. I want to let the light of that, I want, the let, I want that to warm my soul. He wrought wonderfully among them. Oh, friend, does he not work wonderfully among us today? Has he not worked wondrously on the cross for us? Has he not worked wondrously by the presence of his Holy Ghost in us? Does he not do wonderful things as we pray and seek his face? Oh, friend, I just want to stay right here. He worked wonderfully among them. Absolutely. Thank you, diviners. Thank you, pagan priests. You got something right here. God is at work in the land of the Philistines, just like he worked in the land of Egypt. And if you don't let these people or this ark go, you might end up just like the Egyptians because God works wonderfully. Oh, I love that. Did they not let the people go and they departed? Yep, they did. A rhetorical question that the priests asked the leadership. Uh, They were smart enough. Do what they did. That's what he's saying here. The Egyptians were smart enough, do what they did. Let this ark go. And then they give them the way to do it. Verse 7, there begins this list of things that they're to do. So the diviners divine. And there's always, you know, when diviners divine, you've always got this list of things that has to be done. Make a new cart. Okay, now they've probably been carrying the ark around on a cart. But somebody's got to put it on the cart and take it off the cart. So they're handling the ark. They're putting it in carts. They're carrying it around, doing whatever they're doing, parading it through the land, and insulting and affronting God by doing it. And they say, make a new cart. So they want something that is going to carry the ark that has been unsoiled by human hands or animal filth. They want something brand new, something pretty, something clean. Then they say, take two milch kine on which there hath come no yoke and tie the kine to the cart and bring their calves home from them. Now, in this they tempt God. So if he hadn't been affronted and offended enough, now they're going to put a test down. It's like they just can't get enough. You know, so they're going to test him. And they tempt God here with one more miracle. And this is interesting, I think, uh, that they would do it this way. The strong inclination of, this, of these cattle would be to find their calves. So they strap the two milk kind to the cart, and then in their presence they take their calves and they carry them back home. What do those mom cows want to do? They want to go after those babies, don't they? They're always going to want to go after those babies. But guess what? 
they take them home and nothing happens. So this is what they're doing. They're tempting God with this one more miracle. The strong inclination of the cattle would be to find their calves. If they went up by the way of Beth Shemesh instead of stopping and going back home, and Beth Shemesh was opposite to the way of home and unknown to these cattle because they never had a yoke on. They don't know where Beth Shemesh is. They don't know the road that leads that up to Beth Shemesh. So then they'll say, well, so God is at work here, right? God is at work. And then verse 8, take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart. Now they've put it, they've put it everywhere. They've put it in the field. They've put it in the temple. They've put it in the cities. they put it everywhere. Now they're going to put it on the cart, and they're going to send it away. Take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart. The next thing is put the jewels of gold, which you return for a trespass offering, in a coffer by the side thereof. Now, notice this. They respect the ark, and they knew not to look into it, which apparently the men of Beth Shemesh did not do. We'll talk about that another time. But they respected the ark. They knew not to look into it. So the jewels go on the side in a little container just for the jewels. And as they set the ark by the idol, now they set the trespass offering by the ark. So they have really come up in their respect for the ark. So the ark is set on the cart, the jewels in its coffer, by the ark, in the cart, and then they send it away. And it's what the next piece here is. Send it away that it may go. And see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemesh, then he hath done us a, this great evil. So they had stacked the deck against this happening by using the milk kind. But the Lord God is not incapable of controlling his own creation. And, this, this, and of course, this just demonstrates for us divination at its finest. You know, that this is how they're divining whether or not the Lord God had done this. They knew he had done this. They didn't need to divine whether or not God had done this. You know, to read the cows, to read the teas, to read the bones, to read the stones, all of that. That's what diviners love to do. Well, now they want to read the cows as they go. Are they going to go back home? Are they going to go up to the road? Say, so, well, if they go up the road, then here's your answer. This is how you know that it's his hand. They went that way, and nobody told them to. So by this invisible leading of the Spirit of God, these cows now go. And, of course, if you read on down through the chapter, it's beautiful, the imagery here. They go lowing. You know, they're mooing as they go. And they go directly up the hill to Beth Shemesh. And then we have verse 6. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. You see how willing bad men are to shift off their convictions of the hand of God upon them and to believe when they are in trouble that it is a chance that happens to them. And if so, the rod has no voice which they are concerned to hear or to heed. That's Dr. Henry again. However, they can't do that. And so their idea of chance dies on this day. They know that it's God's hand and God doesn't give them a way out. And yet, they don't repent. They know. All of the, divi all of the divining, all of the, all of the putting together the, the cart and the, the jewels and the coffer and the... the the mama cows and the baby cows going home, all of that tells them, yes, this is God's hand. And still, they want to go back to their gods, they want to go back to their lands, they want to go back to their homes, they want to be free of the, free of the boils, but they don't want to deal with their sin. They don't want to deal with the fact that they've really offended the God of heaven. They don't want to deal with that. So is chance a thing? Is chance a thing? Well, some people believe it's a thing. Some people worship chance. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. I know something about that. There's a great big temple there called Churchill Downs. Actually, we had several temples in Louisville, Kentucky. When I was a boy, there was a place called uh, Louisville Downs where they did the harness racing. Harness racing every Friday night. You could go down there and worship the God of chance. Because you know somebody's going to win, might as well be you, right? 
That's the motto of the God of chance. It might just be that it's not him, that it's just chance. And, of course, they didn't want to believe that it was God's hand because then that would mean they would have to take a really hard look at themselves. Now, you might not be concerned that much about the Philistines, but what if I ask this question? Was COVID-19 and the plague that hit the world God's hand of judgment? Was COVID-19 and the plague that hit the United States God's hand of judgment? And immediately, what do you do? You say, oh, no, 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 no. Not America. Not Americans. We're good people. You, you know all the good things we've done. You know, we're, we're the good guys in the world. Not America. Certainly not. Because then, if we say, yes, it was God's hand of judgment upon us, then, ladies and gentlemen, we have to ask a question, don't we? Why is that? Why is it that God is judging America? What sin is he after? What thing are we to repent of? How are we to turn our hearts towards him? See? But I have heard yet anybody ask that question. I haven't heard heard anybody yet in the church ask the question, why the effect that COVID-19 had on the church? It showed the weakness of the church in so many ways. And yet, we talk about it as if it just happened by chance. Oh, it just escaped from a lab. Oh, it just was something that came out of nature. Oh, it just happened by chance. The science tells the science, the science, the science, the science. That's what we believe in, I guess, today is the science. That's the thing, you know. That's where we put our faith now, I suppose. I have yet to hear anybody quote uh, Psalm 91, the plague shall not come nigh thy tent. Nobody was going around quoting that passage. Everybody was wanting to get their their vaccine. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if we if we really believe in chance or do we really believe in the God of heaven who on this day had his ark in a cart that he directed all the way back to Israel who on this day was putting boils on the people of the Philistines and mice in their lands and destroying a nation because of their affront to him. But the Philistines, like the Americans, all they wanted was their gods back. All they wanted was their comfort back. All they wanted was just let me have my Netflix and everything will be okay. Jesus will meet you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.